I hope the PowerPoint is visible. Okay. So let us get started. My name is. So I welcome you all to the PMRF NPTEL session on on the NPTEL course titled Bioengineering: An Interface with Biology and Medicine. This is the week one PMRF NPTEL uh, lecture. And in these sessions, we will go through the previous year's assignment problems of the course. So we will go through the previous year's assignment problems of the bioengineering course, try to solve them together and have a better understanding of the course content and how to approach the problem and the assignments that are given weekly throughout the course. So let me introduce myself uh, to start with. My name is Anubhav Chatterjee. I am a PMR fellow and PhD scholar at the Developmental Neurobiology Lab, the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. This, yeah. So, uh, in this particular week, we have go gone through a basic understanding of what exactly bioengineering is and why bioengineering, bioengineering is required as an interface between biology and medicine and how it is required for every one of the different uh, every one of the different people who even though they have taken medicine as the first priority or engineering so uh, how these sessions will go is we will have a two part session first in the first part what we will do is we will go through the assignment questions i will ask a particular question from the previous year's assignment and ask you to go through them and try and answer them and they will go then we will go through the solution slides on the assignment itself and try and answer them again that will be the first part in the second part of the assignment what we in the second part of the session what we will do is we will go through the doubts that you might have during the course of the week about the course content since we are doing uh, the session on week one mostly we will deal with week one course content so anyone has any questions regarding all of this Oh yes, and I would really recommend everyone, if possible, to turn on their cameras uh, because it is really nice to talk with people and not screens. So, uh, give me just a second. So. Let us start with the first uh, question of today. So this is a previous year's question and uh, the question says, you have been assigned to a microbiology lab and handed a glass slide on which to investigate the phenotypic phenotype of the organism put on. After gram staining it, you classify the organism based on what you see at a 48 microscope. What could be the pro best probable prediction for the microorganism mounted on the slide based on its morphology so this is what you see under 40x microscope and you are being asked to identify what exactly is the organism so you have four options and since this is a round type of question so you only have one option that is correct so the options are budding yeast gram positive bacteria preferably bacillus gram negative proteobacteria preferably pseudomonas and gram negative diplococci preferably Nisseria. So I would like everyone to try and answer this. So just uh, put in uh, which option you think is correct in the chat and then we will get along, uh, like go along from there. So try like what do you think the organism should be depending on the picture given. So Niranjana says it is gram negative diplococcus. Rajesh, Dr. Rajesh also says this is option D that it is it is gram negative diplococcus. Anyone else try, wants to try and answer this? Okay. 
okay more people are joining so uh, for everyone who has just joined now uh, we are uh, doing previous year's questions and this is a particular question in which you are looking at a microorganism at 40x magnification on a slide and want to identify it based on the picture that is given there are four options it is budding yeast gram positive bacteria gram negative bag proteobacteria and gram negative diplococcal so anyone else that wants to try and uh, give an answer in the chat box okay so let us go ahead and try answering this but uh, uh, I would like anyone to try and explain why they think this is the option D. Niranjana, if you want to, you can. Uh... So, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Go ahead. So, basically, the screen is pink in color, so I thought it must be uh, uh, gram negative. And as it's visible, we know that it's spherically shaped and there are two in number, so it's diplococcal. No, yeah, it's okay. nice, nice, excellent. So, the Niranjana has summarized it excellently uh, it is pink in color and we'll learn about gram in just a bit and uh, gram negative bacteria are pink in color and uh, since we see two coccus uh, coccus means spherical shape two means diplococci and thus uh, it is gram negative diplococci and uh, in the question itself i would uh, also suggest that obviously it could not be budding yeast because it has a nucleosome not a nucleus so we see a chromosome that is outside the cytoplasm it cannot be gram positive bacteria because it is pink in color and gram negative proteobacteria that we will get to just so uh, we'll, we are going into the solution slides and first thing we will go through is a morphology of bacteria as i was talking about so bacteria come in different shapes and sizes the major ones are given here uh, the first one is cocci which means spherical shape so we have coccus which is one diplococci two streptococci which is uh uh, yeah, which is a uh, linear coccus form so with, this happens only due to uh, the replication in a particular plane so this plane divides then this then this not in all directions if it divides in all directions we have something known as staphylococci and then uh, so other shapes such as tetrad which are four together and sacrina which are eight so coccus circular and then arrangement of it are given different names next we have bacillus which is essentially uh, rod shaped and we have similar kinds bacillus meaning one diplobacillus uh, bacilli meaning two palisades in which they are arranged a bit haphazardly and streptobacilli like streptococci one plane of division and so we have linear ones and there are other forms as well such as biblio or spirochet and depending on different shapes bacteria can be classified based on morphology so uh, from the question itself we know this is a diplococci as the region also said because it is two circular ones next we will go into something a bit more difficult which is uh, we'll go into uh, we will look into let me do this it does not look very well here so this is what uh, gram positive so let us go back a bit During uh, very early stages of biology, when the microscope was just invented and people were studying microorganisms, there was no proper way to define what kind of organisms, microorganisms or what are different between them. So morphology cannot be the only thing that is different between them. the shapes as we have just seen are very varied and you cannot say which type of bacteria it is based on the shape only or the morphology only. So, then we have uh, we went on something different uh, we went on the staining different cells and the one of the most famous ones is known as gram stain so in gram staining what we do is that we stain a particular microorganism differentially based on their cell wall characteristics and depending on what exactly the staining like what color the cells take up they either can be gram positive or gram negative so first let us understand what exactly is different in different bacterial cell walls gram positive bacteria have something known as a outer membrane uh, they have something known as a peptidoglycan outer membrane that we can see right here they have a cytoplasmic membrane so a cell membrane here 
a bit of periplasmic space and a large layer of uh, peptidoglycan which forms the cell wall. So this is what gram positive bacteria have. Instead gram negative bacteria what they have, they have an extra layer. They have a cell membrane, a peptidoglycan layer and an outer membrane which is made up of lipopolysaccharides. This is the main dividing characteristic between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. That is, uh, gram positive ha do not have an outer membrane of lipopolysaccharides and gram negative have a layer of lipopolysaccharides. There are, uh, if we go deeper into it, there are further differences between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. The first one being gram positive ones have single layer cell wall as we have just seen made up of peptidoglycan and gram negative have double layer cell wall. Gram positive also have several layers of peptidoglycan as you can see right here. So several layers thick of peptidoglycan, whereas gram negative have a single layer. Gram positive say, cell wall are thicker than the gram negative one and have a smaller periplasmic space that is the space between the cell wall and the cell membrane. Gram positive do not have an outer membrane, gram negative have a lipopolysaccharide outer membrane. And after the entire process of gram staining, gram positive bacteria retain a purple color while gram negative bacteria appear pink via the counter strain. Uh, counter strain. So this is essentially the difference between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. We will learn how uh, in the next slide how exactly the staining procedure works to differentiate between them. But essential thing is uh, the baseline is just this that there are two types of bacteria depending on the cell wall characteristics and using the gram staining we can differentiate between them. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? Okay. So I would like everyone to really try and interact because these sessions are meant to be interactive in nature. So like any questions you have regarding the uh, content being discussed, you just throw in the chat box or unmute yourself. Okay. So this is what exactly the difference between the gram positive and gram negative bacteria based on the cell wall. So we will go through uh, the entire gram studying procedure once. So I guess that most of you have an idea of how exactly gram staining works but we will go through it nonetheless. So say you have a bacterial smear that has different types of bacteria, how exactly we will differentiate them between the gram negative and the gram positive ones. So first what we do is that we apply the primary dye which is crystal violet and every one of the cell walls of the bacteria will take it up. So you will see a purple colored smear, every one of them will take it up. Next, you add a mordant iodine which allows crystal violet to stay inside the cell wall. And then comes the important step that is washing with ethyl alcohol. What this does is it removes the outer membrane only. So ethyl alcohol just goes in and removes this outer membrane of lipopolysaccharides. So the, our crystal violet is stuck in the cell wall and once the uh, outer layer gets removed, only for the gram negative bacteria, essentially the entire crystal violet gets removed because it was stuck here only. So after washing, after application of ethyl alcohol, the gram negative bacteria will now appear stainless. So we will have them as transparent. Then you uh, apply a counter strain of saccharin, which is pink in color. And these now, uh, the gram negative bacteria now will take it up again and now will be, uh, will be appearing pink in color. And after the final wash, you can see a smear that looks something like this. The gram positive bacteria appearing purple and gram negative ones appearing pink. So this is how exactly the gram staining procedure works. Anyone wants, uh, everyone clear on this? Anyone wants to ask anything? Okay, so I guess everyone is uh, clear on this, so we'll move on. So, uh, answering the question, you have been assigned a microbiology lab slide with a phenotype of organism and you gram strain it and look at it under 40 eggs. What is the best probable prediction? So, your best probable prediction is gram negative diplococci, preferably in this area, that is a guess. Uh, but essentially, your answer is gram negative diplococci. Anyone has anything to ask regarding this? But we can move. Okay. 
So we are moving on to the next question. And now we have the next question uh, regarding biomimetics. Biomimetics is something that we were dis was discussed extensively in one of the lectures and how exactly we can be inspired by biological designs and make engineering solutions based on those. So biomimetics is the study of biological systems, unique structures and functions to modeling and engineering of materials and machinery. Pick out such evidences of biomimetics from the following options. So you have five options and you will you have to choose which of them are exactly biomimetic. The options are a building where the air condition system has been modeled acceding to the self-cooling nature of termites, insulin producing bacteria where the human insulin gene has been cloned for enormous production of insulin in a small time, using the design of gecko stores to generate a host of climbing materials for humans. The fourth option is option A and C. And the fifth option is option A, B and C. This is only one option uh, correct type of question. So you can go ahead and uh, write whatever you uh, like. Or write whatever you think is the correct answer in the chat box. Hello, am I audible? Okay, so someone has answered. It is option C. Using uh, okay, I'm audible. Okay, so using geckos toes to generate a host of climbing materials for humans. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Rajesh and Sham has uh, Sham has have both uh, chosen option C. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? I guess everyone should try and. Uh, uh, should try and put in an answer at least. So Ria says it is option D, A and C. That is a building where air conditioning system has a model uh, acceding to the self cooling nature of termites and C, using the design of gecko stores to generate a host of climbing materials for humans. Niranjana says it is uh, C, that is using design of gecko stores to generate a host of climbing materials for humans. Okay. So anyone else? Okay. So we will go on and look at the solution slides itself. So why, what exactly by is biomimetic, biomimicry or biomimetic engineering? Okay, Niranjana changes her answer to D. Okay. So biomimicry is learning from and then emulating nature's forms, processes, and ecosystems to create more sustainable designs. So here we have the uh, design of the East Gate building in Zimbabwe which is modeled after the air ventilation system of a termite, uh, termite hill. So uh, using this particular system, the East Gate building was able to ventilate the entire building with uh, around the same efficiency of a normal building at only 10% the power usage. So this is one of the examples of biomimetic engineering or biomimicry in which we try and emulate the nature's own designs in our engineering solutions in order to get better more efficient results. So this is one of the examples. This was discussed in the lecture slides themselves. And this is something that was not discussed that is use of geckos feet. So geckos, you see geckos uh, are a kind of lizard which can stick to the wall uh, as easily as other lizards do because they have uh, nano structures in their toes so each of these toes when blown up to a very very high mag are made out of nano structures that is which looks something like this and uh, do, using these nano structures the keiko can easily get stuck to the wall and then climb the wall and this is was something that was uh, used in climbing equipments to, in order to design climbing equipments such as these which can easily climb the wall even a very smooth glass surface such as glass is using the biomimic, uh, biomimetry or biomimetic engineering as a template. 
So this is an example of climbing equipment made out of mimicry, biomimicry of Keiko's feet, which is shown right here. And uh, thus Keiko's feet, uh, you are making climbing equipment out of Keiko's feet is also an example of biomimetic engine. So that was the uh, answer to this particular question, which is only A and C is the answer, that is option D is the correct answer. That is a building in where, which is modeled after the self-cooling nature of termite mounds. So that what is missing here. And uh, option C, using the design of Keiko stores to generate a host of climbing materials for humans. So, anyone who has any questions regarding this? Okay. Anyone can uh, try and answer why it is not B. B is not considered a biomimetics example. Insulin producing bacteria uh, in which human insulin gene is being cloned for enormous production of insulin in a small time. Anyone wants to try and answer this? You can type in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and answer. Why is insulin producing bacteria, which is something that we use, recombinant insulin or human ring as we call it, is not an example of biomimetics. So, Dr. Rajesh, do you, do you want to go ahead and answer this via chat or via the mic? Uh, uh, does bacteria produce insulin? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Bacteria uh, does not produce insulin, right? Yeah. Naturally. Exactly, exactly. That is the point. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, it is exactly the, how Dr. Uh, Rajesh just said. Bacteria do not produce insulin by themselves in nature. And that is why it is an example of genetic engineering rather than biomimic that is taking from the nature. but it is essentially manipulating the natural systems. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you are correct. It comes in the gene cloning area. Sham, uh, it's bioengineering, I think, sir, uh, which we don't learn from any biological example. That is correct. That is essentially what genetic engineering is. What Dr. Ajesh and Ria said. You are correct as well. So that was the second question. So if anyone has any other uh, something else to add to this. Okay, so uh, we can maybe move on to the next one. So the next question is uh, regarding the Human Proteome Project. The Human Proteome Project or HPP is a global initiative led by the Human Proteome Organization HUPO that intends to change our understanding of the human proteome. What are the major goals of this particular project? You are uh, asked to choose from the four options that are given here. So this uh, human proteome project was something that was discussed in the uh, slides as well, like in the co course in this uh, in week one as well. So your options are: it is a collaborative effort, including numerous research labs throughout the world. Its goal is to map the whole human proteome in a systemic manner using both existing and new approaches. This project has one major aim which is to cover the information about the human epigenome which was completed in April 2003 and it aims to discover the missing proteome of human body and creates the groundwork for development of diagnostic, prognostic, therapeutic and preventive medicinal applications. So we have four options. The first option says it is uh, one and two. The second says it is one, two and four. The third says one, three and four. And the final one says 2 and 2. So this is a round type of answer. So you have only one choice that is correct. So I would ask everyone to try and answer this. Give me just a second. Uh, please put your answer in the chat box. Thank you. 
Okay. So Dr. Ajay says it is one, two, and four. That is, that is, it is a collaborative effort including numerous research labs throughout the world. Global map of human uh, proteome in a systemic manner, utilizing both existing and new approaches. And it uh, wants to discover the missing proteome of the human body. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Now you can go A, B, C, D if it is easier. Just type it in the chat box. It is a B option that is the same as Dr. Rajesh. That is uh, the 1, 2 and 4. Anyone else? Okay, so we uh, look at the solution slide. Uh, this is the this is an image from the HUPO Human Proteome Organization website, and uh, this is essentially what the aim of this entire project is. The HUPO, what HUPO wants is to characterize all nineteen thousand eight hundred twenty three predicted protein coding genes and uh, generate a protein-based molecular architecture of the human body and become a resource to elucidate biological and molecular function, advanced diagnosis and treatment of diseases. Essentially, the human proteome project is similar in its ideas as the human genome project, that is, it wants to sequence and analyze the entire proteome of the human body and wants to make a proteomic map of every tissue present in the human body. So we will have what uh, biological characteristics of the proteins play, what their molecular function is and then use them in order to advance diagnosis and treatment of diseases once the entire protein project is over. This is being spearheaded by the organization, the Human Proteome Project. And the Human Proteome, uh, Proteome Project Organization, if you want to know more about it, is an international scientific organization representing and promoting proteomics through international cooperation, collaboration and by fostering development of new technologies, techniques and trade. So if you go to their particular site, which is you can easily get online, the site uh, you can essentially join directly the HUPO and help in the help out in the whole human proteomics project as well. So this is what exactly it is. So the correct answer regarding this question is uh, the human proteome project is a collaborative effort including the numerous research labs throughout the world. It is also number two, its goal is to map the whole human proteome. And number four, it aims to discover the missing proteome of human body and create groundwork for development of diagnostic and preventive medical applications. So it was option B. Can, uh, so it is not option, uh, like the option number three is the only wrong one, that this aims to uncover information of the human epigenome. Okay, all right, but uh, does anyone know what an epigenome exactly is? What is known as an epigenome or what is known as epigenetics? Can anyone try and answer this? If you do not know that also. What is a, uh, epigenome or epigenetics? Does anyone know? Okay. So, so no one has any idea. So, Dr. Ajis, no idea. Absolutely fine. No one else has any idea about this. Okay. So, uh, epigenetics. So, we know that information hereditary information is transferred from one progeny to the other in the form of genes that is in the form of the coding sequence of the genes is what we are uh, we are talking about so we uh, we get the atgc sequence of the entire chromosome being copied 
to the next uh, generation that is how uh, hereditary information should pass but even there can be hereditary changes or hereditary information being transferred without any change in the coding sequence of the DNA itself. This is known as epigenetics. So when the coding sequence is not mutated, is not changed in any manner, but still you see a change in the progeny, uh, progeny is phenotype essentially, it is via epigenetics. So one of the major examples of epigenetics is methylation. So if we have methylation anywhere in the DNA, this affects how exactly a particular gene is expressed. And thus, even though in the prior progenies, the particular gene is being expressed in one manner, say high level of expression, in the next generation, maybe the expression of that particular gene is low. Even though the sequence is the same, it is just methylation on top of the sequence that changes it. Is that okay? Did you understand what I was trying to tell you? Yes, no, still. Okay. So Dr. Rajesh, I understood. In anyone else? Ria, uh, Niranjana, you have understood as well? Okay, fine. So, but there are other factors involved in epigenetics as well. And I would really like uh, 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 anyone to go and try and answer, uh, like, give it, uh, tell me what the other factor, factors are by the end of the entire session. So you can just Google them and try and tell me what exactly are the different other modes by which epigenetics occurs in, a, in humans. So uh, we move on and look at uh, a very good question. So this is a like heavy one. So you are perusing research on SARS-CoV-2 and you want to understand the entry mechanism of the deadly virus. From literature, you got to know that the human ACE2 receptor is the one through which the virus makes entry. But there are other cellular proteins that are also associated with ACE2 protein and help in virus internalization. What could the best possible method of characterizing those associated proteins can be. So, essentially what the case is that uh, we have SARS-CoV-2 which enters the virus, uh, enters the human cells via a receptor which in this case, uh, in our case was ACE2 receptor. We want to understand what other proteins are involved with ACE2 in internalization of the virus and you want to actually do research on it. So, you, this is essentially what we will do in labs and how exactly the different targets of ACE2 mediated SARS-CoV-2 entry were found out. So the options that you are given, you will perform an immunoprecipitation experiment with anti-ACE2 antibody followed by mass spec characteriz characterization to identify missing proteins. You will perform a complete sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and match it to the human counterpart to find protein coding genes. You will perform a fluorescent tracking of uh, fluorophore conjugated to the ACE2 in Vero E6 cell line to identify all associated proteins. And you can perform a combination of B and C, that is these previous two options to get the best result. So these are your four options, only one of them is correct. And uh, you can try and think this through. How exactly you will understand why of which particular experiment will, be, will you be able to mark down the different proteins downstream of AC? So think this through, and uh, maybe we can go through the since this is a bit interesting question. We will uh, we will go through it sequentially, like maybe. Uh, you can tell me how exactly you are thinking regarding every one of the points. So put down what you think is the correct answer and then we will have a discussion regarding this. Yeah. Can I draw on top of this? This is my question. 
So, uh, anyone wants to try and answer this? Dr. Rajesh says it is option A. That is, we perform an immunoprecipitation experiment with the anti ACE2 antibody followed by mass spectrization to identify the missing proteins. Anyone else wants to try? Ria says it is option B. Sequence SARS CoV 2 genome and compare it to the human genome to find the counterpart protein coding genes. Okay, and uh, anyone else? Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Like, think this through. This is an interesting question, so you will have. Like, you will need to think a bit on this. So, let me help out a bit. Uh, so, maybe a different screen should be presenting now. Is a different screen presenting? Are you able to see a white? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So let me let me draw this out for you. So what exactly is happening is so what exactly ha is happening is we have this is a my cell. This is somewhere is my nucleus, and we have SARS-CoV-2 virus somewhere here. Uh, whatever. Very bad drawing, whatever. So, if we zoom in a bit, how exactly a virus gets into a cell is via a transmembrane protein, which uh, is something like this. So, this is my transmembrane protein, which is in our case ACE2. And we have another protein from the side of the bacteria uh, or the virus, which interacts with it. And this, in our case, is the virus spike protein which you probably you probably would have heard is something that was very well discussed what happens is that spike protein goes and interacts with it and there might be other proteins associated with ace2 which come in and bind to ace2 as well and this binding helps in the internalization of the virus so what exactly will happen is uh, we will have the virus come in and form a cavity like this and the entire virus particle will then get, get engulfed by the cell. So we will have this and we will then have uh, like essentially transfer of nuclear material or essentially the engulfing of the entire bacteria or virus or uh, inside the uh, cell. And this is why the ACE2 protein. So this is inside the cell. So what I, we want to know is that what exactly are these proteins which are associated with ACE2 but uh, which are associated with ACE2 but are not exactly identified yet. So how exactly we will go through uh, this entire thing. So one of the ways we can go through this is so uh, we got some of the answers so one of them was e that is use a immunoprecipitation precipitation method and the second is using a uh, using a sequencing method to go through this now how exactly are proteins identified or how exactly are proteins uh, tagged in vivo is using antibodies. So uh, let me give you a hint. The option, the correct option is option A, and we'll go through how exactly option A is correct. What exactly we will do is, in order to identify which genes or uh, proteins are involved with ACE2, is that we will take an anti ACE2 antibody. So an antibody which will go and bind to ACE2. So this is my anti ACE2 antibody, 
and it will go and bind to ACE2. So we will have an anti ACE2 antibody binding to my ACE2 receptor right here. And this is my anti ACE2. Now, if a protein such as this is already bound to ACE2, so it will also be bound to the anti ACE2 antibody. And if I somehow get the anti ACE2 antibody to like separate it out from the entire lysate, we, what we will have is a complex of this ACE2 protein and this mysterious protein that we are wanting to isolate. So what exactly we did? We took a anti ACE2 antibody bounded to the particular protein we were uh, ACE2 receptor we wanted and using the anti ACE2 antibody we precipitated. So how exactly did, will we get a particular protein out of the lysate? So in, entire thing is a solution. We precipitate out uh, precipitate out. So we precipitated this entire complex of ACE2 and that, uh, that mysterious protein that we want to find and we have the complex out as a precipitate. And this entire procedure is known as co-immuno precipitation. Is that fine? We will we will go through the slides regarding this and we will better understand how exactly this happens. And we have a build slides. Simple. So this is where we left. This is where we left and let us go through what co-immune precipitation is. So co-immune precipitation is a popular technique to identify physiologically relevant protein interactions by using target protein specific antibodies. So our target protein specific antibody was anti is 2 antibody to indirectly capture proteins that are bound to a specific target protein. So as we saw in the uh, drawing that uh, we didn't know what the second protein was, it was unknown. So we do not obviously have an antibody to bring it out of the solute. So we do not have an antibody to capture. But we do have an antibody against ACE2. And using the anti ACE2 antibody, we indirectly capture our required protein. So these protein complexes can then be analyzed to identify new binding partners. That is what we are interested in. Binding affinities. So how, in, how strongly the proteins are bound together kinetics of the binding and function of the target protein. So what exactly happens is that uh, in a particular cell lysis, uh, lysate, we have two a uh, complex of two proteins, X and Y. We know one of the proteins, which is say X. X is something we know, which in our case is ACE2, but we want to catch hold of Y. What we do is that we take anti X antibody, which will bind to X only the structure of X, the sequence of X, then we can design proteins, a uh, antibodies against it. So we uh, trap X and take out the entire antibody and protein complex out of the solution. And this is uh, done by precipitation. And we have these three and then we wash out the antibody and we only have the complex left. And once we have the complex left, what we can do is we can isolate, uh, we can uh, like separate out the two proteins and analyze what exactly the function or the structure or the sequence of Y is and the, then get hold of the protein Y. Since we are using uh, immunological techniques uh, like that is we are using antibodies that is we have immuno in the name precipitation because in this step we precipitate out the entire complex and co because obviously we are doing it with two proteins. So this is the entire process of co immune precipitation. So does anyone have any questions regarding this? So this was a lot, but uh, yes, uh, if you can tell me if I can go through something again, that helps you to understand. 
No, like you know, you didn't understand that. Like I go through. Like should I go through the entire thing again, or did you understand? What is WBMS? So once we have this particular complex, you ha essentially have a solution. You do not know what exactly is in the solution. So what you do is you have to analyze what are the components. So one of the techniques to analyze what a protein is, is known as Western blot. So Western blot is something obviously that I think most of you will have an idea. Of. In Western blotting, we have, we use specific antibodies so say you are guessing it might be one of uh, like you are guessing it is a particular uh, protein Y but how will you prove it is a protein Y? You will do a western blot, blot in which you will use a tagged antibody of anti Y, put it into the solution and if you see after washing out that the antibody is sticking and you get a signal that means that your solution or the complex has the protein Y and you can conclude that the complex was essentially the mysterious protein or the absent protein was actually Y. MS is mass spectrometry that we will discuss in a bit. Uh, so Archana says I should repeat again. Yes, I will. So for the so uh, let us go through it the entire thing. What we have is that we have a complex of proteins. So two proteins out of which one we know. So we know the seg uh, we, we maybe know the sequence of the protein, the structure of the protein. So uh, I will get to Ria's question. So uh, we know the sequence of the protein, we know the structure of the protein, but we know the protein X. So once we know the protein X, we can have antibodies against the protein. So not all proteins have antibodies against them, but we will assume that we have, have an antibody against F, X. So like in our question here, uh, we have an anti ACE2 antibody as given in the option. What we do is that in the complex form we catch hold of X and if it is interacting with another protein Y then when we isolate X using the antibody we will also get Y out of the solution. So we essentially get the entire protein complex X1. Now next once we get the once we precipitate out this entire protein complex we can separate out the antibody and do our analysis on this complex and understand what is the nature of it. So now we will do sequencing via various methods, western blotting in order to identify which protein I uh, like why is which protein. Is that okay Archana? Or no? Or should I go through it? Anyone has? Yes, okay. So everyone understood what co immune presentation is. So it is a, so essentially the, in bullet points you use an antibody against one protein to find its interacting partner is essentially the entire thing. Antibody against X to find the partner one. Okay. So Ria asks if we can use this technique for all other forms of types of protein. So not all but it is regularly used in various uh, different aspects so say uh, in vesicular transport may a uh, lot of the uh, covid precipitation is used in case of signaling molecules you know if you have a signaling path so if you if you know what a signaling pathway is first a ligand binds to a receptor and it starts a cascade of primary uh, secondary messengers tertiary messengers quaternary messengers all the way to the uh, nucleus. So if you know that what uh, if say you know what the receptor is and you want to know what the secondary messenger which binds to the receptor is you use a technique such as this. If you know the secondary messenger and want to know what the next so rung of the ladder is like what is the tertiary messenger of the entire signaling process you again use this but uh, use your antibody against the secondary messenger. So in this way you can identify proteins that complex to you. Is that okay?
yes, no. Uh, was the like did everyone understand what exactly co minute presentation is? Like how is it used? Okay. Probably okay. So uh, it was co minute precipitation, and now we will discuss about a bit about the second part of the question, the answer essentially, which is a mass spec characterization. It is also uh, so we will go through it uh, just off the top of it. So what mass spectrometry is? If you do not know what mass spectrometry is, it is a tool which is, which can be used to identify a particular molecule based on its mass to charge ratio so every one of so even if we go to for a very simple uh, molecules uh yeah very simple ions such as calcium ca2 plus or iron na 2 plus or fe 3 plus or uh, nickel cobalt whatever in the ionic form they have a specific mass to charge ratio that is the mass they hold divided by what their charge is and using mass spectrometry you can know what this ratio is and using this ratio you can identify the particular molecule that you have this is uh, mass spectrometry is commonly used as a high throughput tool for studying protein so nowadays if we have an unknown protein we do not go via antibody uh, like antibody staining or sequencing we can just put through a mass spec what it, do, it does is it is high throughput like you can analyze a large number of proteins at one go and it is very easy to do. In this so uh, the entire procedure is given here how exactly it, uh, it happens we will go through the flow chart. So bear with me and like we will go through it as simply as possible. So say you have mixture of proteins. What you do is that first to digest the proteins and form peptides small fragments of the proteins. You ionize them and give them specific charges and throw them through a mass spec tube. So what the mass spec tube is, it is essentially a long tube which has an electric field in it. And depending on the charge, the particular molecule will go towards one way, positive side or negative side. And this will hamper the amount of uh, like the time taken for it to go through the entire tube. And using this time and uh, other data you can analyze what the mass to charge ratio is once you have particular peptide uh, like the mass to charge ratio of the peptide you dissociate it further to its constitutive amino acids and do another mass spec to understand what the amino acids are so first you have a peptide uh, first you have a protein you break it down to the peptide identify the peptide take that particular peptide identify its amino acid sequence using mass spec and you have a plot which looks like this number of peaks this just gives you which amino acid is in which position and comparing it to a previous database where you can have sequences which look like this and then after that it is mostly computational work which gives you after peptide scoring like you get scores of which is your probable peptide you i have identified the peptide in this stage and after identifying a number of peptides you go and do a protein sequence analysis and match it match the number of peptide hits to our entire protein structure database and you will get the best possible match of the peptide to the protein and then you will say that that is my protein that i started with in this case we started with this aldi 3 phosphate dehydrogenase so the procedure is digestion of protein peptide separation using uh, techniques such as liquid chromatography mass spectrometry of the uh, particular peptide so you pick up a peptide and only do mass spectrometry of that particular peptide you determine the peptide size using it and then second mass spec you do in order to determine the peptide sequence match the peptide sequence to a database to identify the protein uh, the entire process is known as the lcmsms liquid chromatography mass spectrometry followed by another mass spectrometry and this is used as a high throughput technique in order to analyze what proteins you have in your solution. So the question that what exactly is the MSS analysis? This is exactly what the MS analysis is. You take your Y protein, you put it through mass spec, and you know the sequence. So anyone understood what I was trying to say? 
trypsin digestion and peptide mass fingerprinting. So trypsin digestion in order, so digestion when you do, uh, so this step using uh, uses uh, enzymes such as trypsin, uh, trypsin but you will, uh, in order to fingerprint a huge amount of proteins, you will first have to separate it out. So you do a uh, liquid chromatography of it to separate them out. But in order to do fingerprinting, you have to sequence number of, uh, like you do mass sequencing of all the peptides that you do. Here we are not mass sequencing the peptides, we are sequencing the fragments of the peptides which lowers the throughput uh, like uh, increases the throughput by a lot because you are not sequencing every one of them. But yes, this this is, uh, please explain mass spec versus mass spec, mass spec. Okay. So that is mass spectrometry not mass spectrum. So what MSMS means is that you do it in two steps. First you break down the peptides, you do first mass uh, mass spec analysis in order to identify your particular peptide as you can see that you will see separate peaks so this is one peptide this is the second this is the third this peptide itself you isolate from the solution and then you dissociate it further to find the amino acid sequence that is done in the second mass spec and that is why this is known as mass spec followed by mass spec ms ms it can be the same like amplification of peptides not really because you are not amplifying the peptides you have the same starting uh, the number of peptides even the same that you have started with we are just analyzing or do you mean something else Ria? okay so we will go one by one dr rajesh did you uh, do you want anything to add you know, to the particular question about the digestion and the peptide mass spectrometry a uh, mass fingerprinting yeah. so uh, you can uh, actually use mass fingerprinting if you want but that in this particular setup i do not think that is majorly used uh, but you can obviously do a, a multiplex a or isc or something like a, a huge amount of western blot to identify your proteins amartip uh, did you understand the difference between mass spec and uh, like Tandem mass spec. This is also known as tandem mass spec because you do one by one. Amarthi? Okay, hello. So if you get back, you can maybe ask again if you have any question regarding this. So Ria says she has got it and Dr. Raji says. Okay. So this is essentially the entire thing. So the correct answer is perform an immunoprecipitation experiment with anti-ACE2 antibody. MS, MS is what? Amino acid. Yes. So in the second MS, you get the amino acid sequence out of it. In the first, you get the peptide size and information. Uh, like mass to charge ratio. So what essentially happens is that when you dissociate the peptide itself, obviously it is made out of amino acids. So what you next time what goes through the entire mass spec tube is the amino acids. And depending on the mass to charge ratio of the amino acids, which is obviously different from different amino acids, you know which amino acid is coming first, second, third, fourth. So you get a essentially you get a jumbled up sequence such as this. Like you know like uh, these have actually passed through the mass spec but do you do not know the, what exactly the sequence is and you what you do is the peptide scoring that you do it again and again and again and you then determine what the sequence is which enzyme do we use we can use something like trypsin i think trypsin is mostly used yeah maybe uh, i will have to uh, i do not know exactly what is used in different procedures maybe different enzymes maybe have been used but what exactly we need is that uh, we need varied sizes of peptides so anything that uh, chews up proteins uh, but uh, not to the base level like, like amino acid level but anything that gives us random sized peptides is that okay okay So this was the answer to the first question that is you do a immunoprecipitation experiment and TS2 antibody followed by mass spec characterization to identify missing proteins. So this is the first one. So uh, common uh, 
we will just go through the other ones. Perform a complete sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 genome and match it to the human genome to find the counterpart protein coding genes. This is not correct because see, uh, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 does not have an ES2 protein. SARS-CoV-2 codes for other proteins such as its own uh, RNA sequence. RNA polymerase or its spike protein is what SARS-CoV-2 is coding for. What we want is uh, to identify what the human proteins are that are interacting with the spike protein, the ACE2 receptor and uh, downstream. So uh, using the SARS-CoV-2 genome will not give you much. So the, that is the second question so that is obviously not uh, like that is not the correct one. Uh, the third is perform a fluorescent staining by tagging a fluorophore conjugated to ACE2 in vero E6 cell line and identify all associated to So this could be, uh, so this is uh, a separate approach in which you say you make the ACE2 protein itself fluorophore, uh, like fluoros. How to do that? Uh, you can design an ACE2 protein with a EGFP motif attached to it. So you will have the ACE2 going up green but you cannot have like you do not know how exactly you will identify the other protein so how you like the only way to identify the other protein is using something like an immune precipitation experiment which is not there in the third option and obviously combination of b and c to get the correct result is not really the correct way to go so uh, the correct option is the first one. so does anyone want to add anything to this you have anything else to ask maybe another separate approach to the entire thing something else that you want to no. so maybe a different approach is something like guess anything that you can do like how like a, other than the immune precipitation experiment do you know of any other technique that can be used to pull down two separate antibody uh, like proteins maybe that can be something that we discuss in next class like that can be something that you can come to uh, in the next session and we can discuss like any other technique that we can use to solve the particular problem so we go move on to the fifth question which is uh, this is the cell biology basic cell biology uh, the question is a ribosome is a complex molecular machine found inside the living cell they are made up of a few basic biomolecules and perform one of the most crucial functions for cell to live. Point out the correct functional and structural information. Though only one of the options are correct, it is a roundup of answer. So the first option is the structural basis of a ribosome is RNA only, like it is only made up of RNA. Its function is to provide endoplasmic reticulum with a rough texture. Second is the structural basis is only protein. Function is to assign post translational modification in proteins. Third is structural basis is only RNA and protein. It is in charge of converting encoded signals from messenger RNA molecules into amino acid based proteins. And the fourth is structural basis is peptide only. Function it, it provides transmembranal protein uh, movement of proteins apart from synthesizing them. So, four options only one of them is correct. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and try and answer this. So what exactly is like uh, what is uh, what consists of a ribosome like what it is made out of and what is its function you can just uh, type in the chat what you think is the correct option dr rajesh says it is option c anyone else Niranjana says it is now option C. So anyone else wants to try and answer this is like big, like cell biology basics. I guess like we if we had a bit of introduction to biology, then we will probably know this. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Ria also says this. Uh, C Archan also says. Okay. Uh, so let us go through what exactly ribosomes are for everyone, just to you know, be on the same page. A ribosome is an intracellular, intracellular structure it will be, 
made out of both RNA and protein and it is the site of protein synthesis in the cell. Ribosome reads messenger RNA or mRNA sequence and translates it into the genetic code into a specific string of amino acids which grows into long chains that fold to form proteins. Amino acids are carried via transfer RNAs or tRNAs. Ribosome consists of major, uh, two major components, the small and the large subunits. So we, here we have the small subunit, here we have the large subunit and the small subunit goes and binds to our chromosome uh, DNA uh, sequence. The large subunit binds uh, like uh, the large subunit is where the synthesis actually occurs. We have three channels, the entry site in which the tRNA enters the, uh, and the synthesis site in which the amino acid gets synthesized and there after the tRNA moves up. This is the entire process. So uh, this is how ribosomes act. So can anyone tell me what exactly are these like sequences to which the tRNA bind like first question which should be how many types of uh, RNAs are there we are talking about two here mRNA and tRNAs are spelled out in the particular paragraph how many types of RNAs are there in a the cell does anyone know three types which are those mRNA tRNA and RNA so mRNA we have seen so, uh, Ria also says mRNA, T, R, and A. A, I guess, is mRNA you mean? I will assume that. So, okay. So, uh, mRNA uh, is the messenger RNA that contains the, uh, the, that contains the genetic information that you can see right here in the form of triplet codons. So, every three uh, nucleotides uh, actually encode for an amino acid these uh, and uh, encode for an amino acid then the mRNA the tRNA are the transfer RNAs that carry on one end the amino acid being uh, incorporated into the growing peptide chain and on the other end the codons so it matches to the particular codon moves to this channel and add this uh, amino acid to this peptide so in the next step this tRNA will move to this position, the red will go in the next uh, like peptide sequence. So it will go right here after the yellow. And the rRNA are the ribosomal RNAs that make up uh, the ribosome. So as you saw that it, uh, ribosome is made out of RNA and protein, these proteins, uh, these RNAs are the rRNAs. And these are also known as ribozymes because they act as enzymes as well. So, Another distinction is something that I got to make right here is that between prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, organisms, the ribosomes are actually different. In prokaryotic ribosomes are 70S ribosomes and eukaryotic uh, it is 80S ribosomes. The entire thing is 70S. The last sub subunit in the prokaryotic one is made out of uh, is the 50S subunit. The smaller is the 30S subunit. In the eukaryotic it is the 60S and the 40S. And then we have other separation such as like the RNAs themselves are the 16S RNAs in the small subunit and the 18S in the eukaryotic small subunit. Is that fine with everyone? Yes. Okay. So, so something that I did not say is what exactly is this S? And why don't the large and the small add up to this number? So 50 plus 30 should be 80s, but this one is 70. And 60 and 40 should be 100s, and it instead is 80. Why is that the case? Can anyone guess? Does anyone know what the S stands for? Swedberg constant. Nice. So, so, what exactly? So, uh, can you give me a very simple uh, definition of what exactly that is in the chat? So, uh, okay. So, let me help you. Uh, like, obviously, it's a sweet book uh, unit. Uh, very nice. So, what exactly it is is that 
while cent if you go ahead and centrifuge the entire cell kill it get the sedimentation coefficient exactly so you go ahead and uh, centrifuge the entire cell kill it and do what is known as cell fractionation so you want to make so you centrifuge it entire thing out and you find at the 70s of the 70s uh, so s is a particular unit in the map so at the 70th s position you will find the uh, entire prokaryotic right and at the 30th position you will find the small subunit at the 40s position the uh, 50s position you will find the large subunit so essentially you are looking at a tube and at separate levels you see separate organelles being uh, captured there so after centrifugation you have separate layers and at separate positions you have different things. so at the 70s level you will have the prokaryotic ribosome 50s you will have its large subunit dissociated for the entire thing and at the 30s position you will have the small subunit similar for the eukaryote so this is not essentially addition because uh, Swedberg constant does not go via addition because we know centrifugal force works via the square of addition and we have so, something some different mathematics where it is it is not simple addition that way it will go and uh, add up to that so 80 is for the uh, eukaryotic 70 for the prokaryote one other thing that i would like you to pay mind to is that prokaryotic rnas are 16 s uh, like how 16 s rna in the small subunit whereas eukaryotic ones have an 18 s rna in the small subunit if so this is uh a difficult question do you know where exactly the 16 s rna played a major role in the evolutionary context or exactly the taxonomical context like what so 16 s rna was used to do something very interesting like maybe change the way we learn about how kingdoms are classified like how we classify organisms does anyone know about that so that is the question that we are coming to next. So that is why we are making the background for it. Does anyone have any idea? Phylogenetic classification. Uh, yes, it is the phylogenetic classification. What exactly happened is that before long, so probably everyone of us have read that we have a five kingdom classification. Archana says it relates to find microorganisms, microorganisms. Not directly Archana. So what happened is that if you remember, uh, you, you would have uh, like we have all gone through the five kingdom classifications while going through our studies, or like in school, and we know that there are five kingdoms. So there was a particular person known as Carl Woos. What he did is that he went in and started see, uh, looking at the RNAs, especially the rRNAs present in various organisms, and he found. That there was a very distinct feature of the 16 SR RNA present in prokaryotes, and he found that the bacteria, bacteria have a specific 16 SR RNA, and the archaea have a specific 16 SR RNA, and everything else, which is the eukaryotic cohort, had the 18 SR RNA. And based on that, Carl Woos divided the entire phylogenetic classification or the taxonomy into bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which are now, which is now the accepted system, which is also known as the tree of life, as we will just see. So, depending on the sequence of the 16S rRNA, the uh, entire taxonomy is now divided into three parts: bacteria, archaea, eukarya. So that was this. So we will get to that particular question, but to first let's answer this one. The structural basis of RNA ribosome is obviously RNA and protein. Function is to convert encoded signals from messenger RNA or mRNA molecules into amino acid based proteins. Okay, so ah, so okay. This is a, okay. This is a question that we are dealing with. So pick the incorrect statement of U bacteria. So this is the taxonomy based question. So the options are incorrect uh, statement of U bacteria. Many U bacteria are extremophiles, surviving in the extreme environments like hot spring or deep sea. They are known as true bacteria. Their protein synthesis or translation is initiated by the amino acid formylmethionine or FMET. 
they are much more evolved form of bacteria and very close to archaea bacteria. So four options, you have only one option that is correct. So you go ahead and put it in the chat box. Actually, one option which is incorrect, rather the opposite way around. Which do you think is correct in case of U bacteria? Which sounds the most incorrect of all of this? You can try and answer this. Archana says it is A or D. Many eubacteria are extreme occurrence surviving in extreme environments like hot spring or deep sea. Or D, which is they are much evolved, more evolved from bacteria and very close to archaea. Niranjana says it is D, which is incorrect. More evolved form of bacteria, very close to archaea bacteria. Arushi says it is A. Uh, eubacteria are extreme occurrence surviving in extreme environments like hot spring or deep sea. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? I guess not. So, okay, so we have a video here. So, we will play the video. And, uh, so, this video is essentially about the tree of life classification that I was talking about. And if it plays, then it will be very nice. Please play. Play. Okay. okay. Okay, so the this is not playing. That is fine. Now uh, we will talk about it. Very strange that is not playing. Okay. Uh, so uh, this was essentially about the classification of organisms. We will talk about them in the picture itself. So classification of organisms, as I said, was done by Carl Moose in, uh, into the three domain system, in which he divided the uh, yeah, the entire tree of life into the uh, bacterial branch, the archaea branch, and the eukaryota branch. And this was done based on the 16 srRNA sequence. One thing to pay, keep in mind is that you will find that the archaea is somewhere in between the bacteria and the eukarya. And the major differences between them is that the archaea, uh, like major difference between bacteria and archaea is that archaea has a different cell wall architecture. It is something, it is, does not have peptidoglycan as we have just learned about to gram positive bacteria, but it has something known as pseudopeptidoglycan or sometimes isopenes. So separate cell wall. It, uh, but the translation system is the same, transcription system is the same, whereas the 16S are RNA or like the sequence of it is sim uh, more similar to the eukaryotic branch than the bacterial branch. So it is more as shown in the picture itself that the life divided into two ways, first towards bacteria, second half, then gets divided into the archaea and the eukarya. One other thing is that obviously these two parts are the only ones that have cell walls that are made out of uh, stuff like peptidoglycans and everything else, whereas eukaryotes have cell walls made out of polymers such as cellulose if they have it, or uh, chitin in case of fungi and archaea and bacteria obviously do not have a specific uh, organelle compartments whereas eukaryota have and that is how the name comes u meaning true karyota means nucleus so true nucleus whereas these two do not and when this classification was first made then uh, archaea was actually called archaea bacteria and bacteria was known as u bacteria or true bacteria but later on those got uh, removed and we only have bacteria and archaea. So essentially bac eubacteria and bacteria are the same thing. Whereas archaea and archaea bacteria are the same. And finally both bacteria and archaea can live in extreme conditions. If you know that the organism we use for PCR, therm therm uh, Thermos aquaticus, uh, from which tac polymer is, is taken out using which PCR is done is also bacteria. So like uh, both of them can live in a uh, high yeah, or very bad conditions in uh, like very extreme conditions but that is not uh, 
the distinction that can be made between the key and the R key. So the correct option, uh, incorrect option uh, actually is the, uh, that U bacteria are more evolved from bacteria and very close to archibacteria. U bacteria are essentially true bacteria or what we call bacteria now. They are not something else. So anyone wants to add something to this? This was pretty straightforward. Yeah. Anyone wants to say something regarding this? You have understood, yes. Yeah, okay. So we'll just move on. So this is something again cell biology uh, oriented. So this is uh, this particular thing is showing obviously a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic, how we can say that it does not have a nucleus, it has a nucleosome. Nucleus are uh, chromosome out into the cytoplasm. So uh, we are being asked to label the separate parts of it. I guess we can just go ahead and label it. Uh, like uh, A, B, C, and D are uh, four separate things. We are given four options. Uh, so A is cell wall, B is chromosome, C is vacuum, D is flagella. In the first option, in the second, it is A is cell membrane, B is chromosome, C is plasmid, D is reproductive pili. In the third, it is A is cell wall, B is plasmid. C is extracellular DNA, D is pili, and the final one, A is cell membrane, B is chromosome, extracellular DNA, C, and D is the cell adhesive motor. So Archana goes ahead and says it is B, that is A is cell membrane, B is chromosome, C is plasmid, and D is reproductive pili. Niranjana also says the same, it is B. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Dr. Rajas also says B. Anyone else? Sakshi also says B. So, yeah, also says. So, so there are, we have just uh, like, we'll just go through the structure of the prokaryotic cell for each cell. That uh, this is the structure of the prokaryotic cell. We obviously have seen it again and again. Anushi also says it is B. So, we'll just go it uh, quickly. So, the dotted structures are the ribosomes. Plasma membrane is the internal structure right here. Cell wall is the external structure. Capsule can be the outer membrane or capsule that the uh, prokaryotic cell has. Plasmid is the extracellular circular DNA which can autonomously replicate and can have separate genes that are translated separately as well. These big structures are the bacteria flagellum which help in the bacteria to move. Pili instead is something interesting. So what pili are? These are reproductive organs present in the bacteria. One of the better examples of it is the uh, pillars of the uh, E. coli having the F plasma or the fertility plasma. What that does is that uh, that uh, particular plasmid codes for this pillars kind of structure and this is essentially a tube. When two bacteria come close to each other, this tube fuses the two bacteria and the plasmids can travel from one uh, bacteria to the other. So that is why it is known as the reproductive uh, pili as well. Like they have been the reproduction of the plasma essentially. And uh, we have the nucleoid containing the chromosome and the cytoplasm is the internal structure. So that is the structure of the prokaryotic cell and obviously everyone uh, chose correctly. A is cell membrane, B is chromosome, C is plasmid and D is reproductive pillar. We are on the same page regarding this. Yes. We are okay, yeah. We can move on. Yes, okay, thank you. So this is the next question. Uh, you are back to working in a laboratory where you are instructed to culture an unknown strain. After 48 hours of sticking in a culture plate, you observe that bacteria have an extended thread-like morphology. What is this organ called and what kind of functional structural benefit does it impart to the organs? So here is the picture that shows the particular strain. You have streaked it out. Obviously, streaking is something we probably have all the, like done and looked into. So you streaked it out. You look into the colonies at high mag and you see that the bacteria looks something like this. As we have just seen, it is a bacillus, a broad shape that 
in the starting of the uh, slides we have seen and it has some extended structures such as this and the question asks what is this extended structure that we are looking at the options are one that it is an organelle known as flagella which functions as a gliding movement a function uh, which whose function is to give gliding, uh, gliding movement to the cell second option is the organelle is pili and the function is cellular metabolism third option is organelle is flagella function is rotatory movement and the fourth option is pili the function is atp production so this is again a one option per type correct answer please go ahead and put the option in uh, the chat box okay so niranjana says it is c dr rajesh also says it is c anyone else wants to try an answer riya says it is a okay anyone else Sakshi says also it is A. That is, flagella has a function in gliding. Okay. So let us go through the solution slide. So uh, again, we go to our previous diagram. These are the different structures of the cell. And flagella is this extended part which helps in cell movement. So flagella thing uh, is correctly identified, obviously, by everyone. So, but what exactly is the function of the flagella? So, what flagella is uh, attached to the cell membrane or the cell body via basal body, which houses the cellular motors in order, which helps in the movement of the flagella. Now, the movement of the flagella, so flagella is, uh, looks something like this in this diagram. It is a hook-like structure. So, it is bent like this. And how the uh, flagella moves is that it moves in a propeller-like rotatory motion. So, it... Uh, this basal body starts moving it around and around like this, which helps the flagella to move. And as you know that in a boat, where the propeller moves in a rotatory fashion, the boat can move forward. And that is what exactly happens. The flagella moves in a rotatory motion and the cell can move forward. And this is mostly occurs in the anti-clockwise direction, the movement occurs, so that the, it can move in the forward direction. Clockwise means it will uh, rotate, go in the backward direction, which is not very nice. So, flagellar movement occurs in the rotatory. Flagella is the long elongated structure uh, formed by the cell body and it, uh, it rotates in the rotatory motion and it is made out of the protein flagellin. It's something that we must keep in mind. So, the correct option is C, the organelle is for the flagella and the function is rotatory. Is that okay? Is that fine? You're fine with it, right? Okay. 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 So we go to another interesting topic, which is interest, uh, which is signal. Uh, this particular. Uh, Okay, something happened. I'm still visible, right? Any other function of oh, 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 what do you what do you mean? Of flagella. The main function of flagella is really in uh, movement. It, it does have another kind of basic function which is it does not let Mm, uh, it uh, helps in sticking of the bacteria to some surfaces maybe like when uh, in case of cold or some other diseases we have the bacteria sticks to our uh, oesophagus in order to not move out so that in that also flagella sometimes helps but major major function is in is that fine okay so, uh, so we move on to the next question which is signaling 
So intracellular signaling happens in a variety of ways inside a human body. Following is a diagram which represents which type of signal. So we have a cell producing an uh, exosome. So this is an exosome uh, which is a lipid bound membrane uh, which contains something. So this releases a signal which again goes into the cell itself. So cell releases a signal, goes back to itself. So this kind of signaling is known as, the options are autocrine signaling, contact dependent signaling, paracrine signaling or endocrine signaling. So again, this is the only one type of answer is correct type of question. Archana says it is A autocrine signaling. Maria also supports A autocrine signaling. Dr. Rajesh is also says it is A autocrine signaling. Anyone else? Okay. So uh, let us go through what exactly cell signaling is. So cell signaling, uh, we'll go simply through this flowchart. So essentially what happens is that if we consider that our cells are just non-motile, non-understanding structures of our entire body, that will not be very correct. Cells are essentially, uh, cells always are talking to each other. They're always sending information from one cell to the other and informing them of what is uh, going on in the surrounding and what exactly they have to do. So how they do it? They do it via process of the cell signaling. So in cell signaling, the major motive is that we have a sending cell or a talking cell which sends out its signal via uh, intercellular ligand, which can be any molecule. It goes and binds to the receptor of the second cell uh, and this binding causes a response in the second cell which is what we needed. So this response can be movement of the cell, transcription of specific genes, stop in transcription of specific genes, change in cell cycle, uh, cell cycle stage of a particular cell can be anything depending on what the signal is. So this uh, this response will only happen in a target cell which has received the ligand and has the receptor to respond to the ligand. That is the only target cell that can respond. And a non-target cell represents one which either has not received the ligand or does not have the receptor that can respond to that particular ligand. So that is a non-target cell. So in this way, the cells talk to each other or cells simply happen. This is the basic motive. It, is that fine? That's okay, right? Okay, okay. So now we will look at uh, what uh, exactly are different types of signaling that occurs. So this is the general motive that occurs. Now signaling can be uh, described in different, uh, like uh, can be uh, differentiated between themselves depending on the distance the target cell and the sending cell are. That is essentially how we separate signaling types. In the first type, uh, it is uh, when the signal cell is way further away than the target cell. And in that case, we uh, what uh, the only way that the signal can reach the target cell is via the bloodstream. And this is known as, so the large scale signaling is known as the endocrine signaling. So uh, can anyone give me an example of what uh, endocrine signaling looks like? Like we know, like a very good example. Everyone knows the endocrine signal. Like how one cell or one organ can send a signal out to the entire body, and it can respond. Does anyone have any idea what an example of the endocrine insulin from pancreas to body cells? Excellent. That is very nice answer. So uh, insulin which is being produced 
it acts as a what uh, adrenaline is also uh, another endocrine signaling molecule which is known as both of uh, both insulin and adrenaline are known as what are they known as starts with uh, thyroxine are also correct but what are they known as start with an h Hormones, exactly, exactly, exactly. Hormones are the word I was looking for. So, thyroxine, insulin, adrenaline are different hormones which are uh, released, and these are the major example of endocrine signaling. So, well, we have deficit in our hormonal glands, adrenal gland, thyroxine gland, pancreatic beta cells, pituitary gland, every one of them that release hormones into the bloodstream which help the entire body to react. So, that was endocrine signaling. Next, we have paracrine signaling where the scale is very short. The cells are very close by together to each other and they uh, signal directly to uh, each other. So, these can be say various signaling pathways such as WIT, BMP, FGF, short range signaling pathways. So, that, that is paracrine signaling. Then we have something known as autocrine signaling. That is, the cell releases some uh, some ligands and the cell itself can respond. That is known as autocrine signal. And let me give you an example. The, uh, the example is growth factors are one of the examples in which the cell, if the cell needs to grow, it releases growth factors and it has receptors to the growth factors itself and then it can grow. But uh, can you cite an example of a disease in which growth factor based autocrine signaling can go haywire can like without any feedback loop can cause a very bad disease like uh, unlimited proliferation of cells via discontinuity of the yeah discontinuity of the autocrine or uh, the growth factor system uh, dr ajay is correct cancer is the major example of it in which cancer cancerous cells themselves can uh, release autocrine growth factors and then start uh, propagating and proliferating endlessly. So that was autocrine signaling. And finally, we have contact dependent or uh, juxtacrine signaling. This is known as juxtacrine, as in they are just next to each other, just that the spelling has an X in it. G U X T, juxtacrine signaling. Cells must physically interact to initiate the signal, as we can see right here. The example of it is the notch delta pathway that occurs in a particular signaling context. Uh, so paracrine signaling and the famous example can also be neurotransmitters from the appendix to the next nerve or the neuromuscular junctions. We know neurotransmitters are transferred from the nerve to the next one in order to transfer the signal. That is also an example of paracrine signaling. So that was the four types of signaling. Anyone, uh, anyone has anything to add to this? Anyone wants to ask anything? Anyone wants to add anything to this particular discussion about cell signaling? Anything you have to ask? Okay. Okay. So we move on. So one thing I would like to add: in uh, case of signaling, it is not just biomolecules that we can think. It can be other things as well, like growth factors or uh, anything else are signaling molecules, but non-organic molecules such as CO2. Can also act as uh, signaling molecules. So, using the diagram itself, we know that the cell itself is producing a signaling molecule to which itself the cell itself is again responding. So, this is a part of autocrine signal. Anyone wants to add anything to this? Any questions about uh, the signaling pathways? If not, we will move forward. I guess this is our last question that we deal with today. So the question is, mature cells in plants are considered totipotent. Choose the best choice from the list below that uh, support the particular state. 
The options are they possess stem cell like properties that can de differentiate into cell or all of the specialized cell types. They have the ability to differentiate into downstream cell lineages only. They help transforming neighborhood cells, both A and B, both B and C. Uh, there are five options, only one is correct. Mature cells in the plant are considered two tip, which are the following is true. You can put in your answer in the chat box. Priya says it is C. They help transfer in neighborhood cells. Niranjana says it is A. Sakshi also says it is A that they possess stem cell like properties and can de differentiate into all specialized cell types. So, okay, Dr. Rajesh also says A. So, anyone who Priya changes her answer to both A and B. They have the ability to differentiate into downstream cell lineages only and can uh, and have stem cell like properties. So can anyone, uh, so uh, this, the word stem cell is going around a lot. So can anyone uh, unmute and tell me what a stem cell is? Or you can uh, write in the chat box as well, which is what is easy then. What is a stem cell? Pluripotent. Archana says pluripotent in nature. Okay. I can stem cells can specialize into other cells. Yes, that, that is more like it. So uh, pluripotent is the word that is used regarding cell stem cells. So stem cells can be totipotent, pluripotent, multipotent, as we will see in the later, later slides. But the major major thing is that stem cells are cells that can give rise to other cells. So in our body, say we have a particular cell such as a nerve a neuron it cannot form anything else it only stays as a neuron a cardiac myocyte a ca that is a muscle cell that is in the heart can only form another cardiac myocyte cannot form anything else a stem cell can form anything else so for example a hematopoietic stem cells gives rise to the entire blood cell lineage from the neutrophils, it from the leukocytes, it from the platelets, everything. So one cell that can form other types of cells is known as stem cells. So they, these are two properties that a stem cell should have. One is that it can form other cells and it can self-renew, that it can form other stem cells. So we will go through the uh, this thing here. Uh, this is the, what we will go through. So what exactly are stem cells? Stem cells are cells that give rise to all other cells in an organism. They have the ability to self-renew and give rise to differentiate specialized cell types. So these two need to be there for a cell to be called a stem cell. Self-renew, that is for another stem cell and differentiate into specialized cell type. This is what a cell, uh, stem cell is. So, yeah, so we will go through what the different types of stem cells are. To the first type. Is known as a totipotent uh, stem cell. So st these type of stem cells are only found in the fertilized oocyte or the morula stage of the embryo. These cells are totipotent and can give rise to every one of the cells in the uh, adult organism, any one of them. And in this stage, if you have a specific divide, you are uh, like a, spe a specific type of divide between the cells, you will find the formation of uh, twins and the, that is what happens because all the cells can form an entire organism if cells are separated out they can form twins by themselves because this cell will form one organism this will form another organism that is what is known as a totipotent stem cell and it can obviously form other stem cells as well next is known as pluripotent stem cells so we are going up uh, run down it can give rise to all other cell types other than extra embryonic structures. So this is the stage which we find in the blastula stage of the embryo and it can give rise to all uh, structures of the adult but cannot give rise to extra embryonic structures such as the placenta. 
that is what we call a pluripotency. Next, we go another step down, which is known as the multipotent cell, which can form many different cell types of uh, specific lineage or type. So this we form uh, like as development proceeds, we have these type of multipotent stem cells, such as as give, I give the example of hematopoietic stem cells, which can form lymphocytes, monocytes, erythrocytes, neutrophils, everything. Everything in our blood can be formed from one cell. So it is known as a multipotent. So it cannot form everything, but it can form multiple things. And finally, we have unipotent. And ca it can give rise to only one differentiated cell. Type. So it is a unipotent stem cell involved epidermal stem cells, which can only form fibroblasts. But they can form it. And can, uh, they can self -form. That is why they are known as unipotent stem cells. So these are the uh, different types of stem cells. Anyone wants to ask anything regarding this? Okay, I guess not. So there is another type of stem cell that I, I have not discussed here, which is known as a induced pluripotent stem cell. And this is all the rage nowadays regarding research. Uh, cell or I, IPSC. Induced pluripotent stem cells or IPSCs. I would like everyone to go and uh, at least look at the concept ones. The, these are very interesting. The, these are like very interesting, interesting thing. And maybe we can discuss any doubts you have regarding this in the next class. So uh, we move on to the question itself, which is uh, the plant cell totipotency. What is the word totipotency of plant cells? The thing is that, as we can see, this one is a uh, animal embryo, animal cell embryo. But, and that is why the totipotency, as you can see, ends at the molecular stage. After that, everything is pluripotent or lower. But a plant cell is totipotent. So if you have ever seen plant cells, if you cut out anything, a branch, a flower, a leaf, roots, the plant regenerates. How does it regenerate? The thing is that all of the plant cells have the ability through which it can regenerate an organ on the entire plant. One cell can form the entire plant again. This is known as totipotency, like plant cell totipotency. As I said, totipotency is the ability to form the entire embryo or the entire adult structure and plant cell, every one of the cells has that ability. So plant cells can go ahead and form the entire plant again. So how does it happen is what we are going to uh, try and understand. Uh, so this is how exactly it happens. We'll go through slowly. So say you take a particular cell out of the plant, and that is in this cell, which is a SC or somatic cell. Somatic cells are the normal differentiated final stage cells. Those are known as somatic cells. Now, somatic cells can go uh, either of the either of two reprogramming routes. One, it can directly form a totipotent cell. So the cell reprograms itself once it sees it is alone out there. It reprograms itself and forms a totipotent cell. So totipotent cell, or it can reprogram itself and start proliferating and make up a lot of other cells and together form an embryonic callus which is of uh, essentially a plant embryo like of structure and this entire thing or this thing can give rise to a somatic embryo so either the embryonic callus transforms to a somatic embryo or the totipotent cell transforms to the somatic embryo and the somatic embryo is the one that can form the entire plant again. so this is the steps via which plant uh, cell uh, totipotency can occur. First is you take a somatic cell out and then it reprograms itself via the either of two routes, direct formation of somatic embryo via totipotent cell 
or indirect formation of a somatic embryo via a embryonic callus which then forms a somatic embryo and this gives rise to a uh, entire plant. So this is how plant cells achieve totipotence. Okay. Anyone wants to ask anything regarding this? Anything anyone wants to add to this? No. So the correct option is they possess uh, mature cells in plants are considered totipotent yes, because they possess stem cell like properties and can de differentiate into all specialized, specialized cell types. So I would say that this essentially the word should not be de-differentiate but re-differentiate like but no either or will A, is it re-differentiate excellent question. So it is not re-differentiate in the way I think you are imagining it. So what happens is that a, the cell, stay, uh, the totipotent plant cell, right here, it de differentiates back to the original. So, essentially, the reverse of this particular screen. So, you have, say, a skin fibroblast going back the entire way to this stage. So, it is, so this is the direction in which differentiation is occurring, and it goes back to this stage. So, it is de differentiating to this stage. And then re differentiating back to the entire embryo. So, this is the de differentiation and re differentiation I am talking about. If instead it directly transforms from here to here without these states, then the process is known as trans differentiation. So, uh, differentiated cell type transforming to another completely different cell type known as trans differentiation. But it goes back to a stem cell like stage and then comes back de differentiation and re differentiation. Is that fine? Yes, no, maybe. Archana, is that fine? Or do you have anything to ask? Okay. So that was this question. And uh, okay. so uh, we are done with the questions of the previous year's week one assignment. So I would uh, like uh, if anyone to put in any questions that they had regarding the course content other than the ones we discussed, or anything in the course uh, like the slides we just discussed. Does anyone have any questions? So today we do not have much. You know, like uh, we like discussed a lot about uh, the bioengineering aspect. Why exactly bioengineering is required? About cell biology, we learned a lot about different process uh, techniques that are used in labs, such as immune precipitation, mass spec, gram staining, and finally we ended up about uh, on a bit of learning about different cell types such as stem cells and how exactly taxonomy works in case of uh, 16 in rice uh, in the case of division into bacteria archaea and eukaryote so a, a, anyone wants to add anything to this okay so someone has joined so i guess uh, sorry that we are we are just closing up uh, if you have any question regarding this week's uh, uh, post content, Divya, you can go ahead and put it uh, like unmute yourself and ask. Or you don't, you can just put it into the chat box. Divya? Okay, so the, that was then this week's week one PMR of NPTEL session. This particular YouTube channel link that you see right here is the one where this particular recording will be uploaded. Also, the other recordings that we do 
uh, in the subsequent weeks so we'll also be uploaded to this channel so in case you are not able to join the session you can go ahead and get to the youtube uh, link and uh, go through the slides that we have discussed the slides that we have discussed will also be uploaded and will be accessible by you and the as you see that we will be holding these sessions every week on tuesday 7 to 9 pm and uh, this will probably help you this will help you to solve the week's uh, particular assignment questions i know that i think the week one's assignment questions are due in three days yeah or tomorrow itself maybe so maybe you can go ahead and look into them and answer uh, after looking through the slides that we have discussed any questions regarding the particular sessions can be addressed in the NPTEL forum that you have that there is a NPTEL course forum that is there you can just uh, tag PMRF session or my name and say that you have particular questions regarding the session and I will be happy to go ahead and answer it for you. So that was today's welcome Dr. Rajesh. Thank you. So that was today's PMRF NPTEL session. Uh, hope to see you all next week in which we will go through more interesting topics and delve more deeply into yes welcome uh, we will delve more deeply into genetic engineering itself next week will be even more interesting so thank you everyone for joining and i see you all next week